Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. It's great to have you guys here today. You can uh, open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 6 if you've got a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device. If you don't, there's Bibles in the chair around you. We'd love for you to grab one of those and use it tonight. Uh, if you're watching online or you're tuning in from Parker today, we're glad to have you as part of the Calvary family. Uh, it's always great uh, knowing that uh, you guys are out there tuning in and uh, a part of our church uh, you know, as we were getting ready for this week, I was thinking about how many questions uh, come my way each and every week, but even each and every day. And uh, if you're a parent, you know the reality behind this and the, the seemingly endless stream of questions uh, that come into your life each and every day. Uh, and as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the amount of questions my kids ask, and I, I don't think they're abnormal in that. I think all kids do that. But, but I was thinking about the, the challenge that comes with some of these questions. And sometimes uh, the questions stress me because I have to repeatedly answer the same question over and over. Like, why, you know, why do I have to eat my vegetables? Why do I have to go to bed at this time? Are we there yet? Those types of questions. And the challenge is just the, the repetitive nature of some of those things, right? Some of the, sometimes the challenge comes in, in the ability to, to break down really complex questions and situations into something that for me, a preschooler and kindergartner can understand. Like, Dad, why does you putting gasoline into the tank of your truck equate to movement? And I know, I know intellectually up here how that happens with internal combustion and the transmission and all that, but breaking that down for a kid, you're like, okay, this, this, this is a, a little exercise here for me. Sometimes the, the challenge is in trying to remember subjects that you haven't thought about in a really long time. Like Thursdays, I'm driving my kids to school and my daughter asks, hey, daddy, why is Mr. Moon out when Mr. Sun is out too? And I'm like, I haven't thought about the solar system in a long time. <laughs> like, it's been a long time since we had the little styrofoam balls hanging and, and all of that and the different color. And I'm like, I'll get back to you on that. I don't really remember. But sometimes the challenge is in trying to answer a question that you don't fully have an answer for. And earlier this week, uh, my son was sharing that one of his kids has a birthday on the 4th of July, so we were talking about, you know, hey, his birthday is on a holiday, and that's really cool. And he asked, hey, what's on my birthday? Well, my son was born on September 11th. And so we got to sit there with our six-year-old and briefly but accurately share what happened 21 years ago on September 11th, to which he responded, why would someone do that? And I go, that's a great question. And I can answer in, in my head intellectually, I can talk about the effect of sin and, and, and the, the power of in presence of evil in the world, but that doesn't fully answer the question for a six-year-old. And see, all around us are challenging questions and, and our life is filled with questions. And if you're a parent, you get this. You get why you've got to answer all these questions, ranging from why do I have to eat my vegetables to why can't I do what my other friends are doing. If you, you know, uh, are in the workplace and you lead or manage people, you get the constant stream of questions that come your way about how you always have to be the one making the decision and answering those. And I think even if you have a heartbeat and you're breathing oxygen, you get that that life is filled with questions. Questions that people ask you, questions that you're asking about life and the world around you, and it's no different with Jesus. Because people asked him an incredible amount of questions. People are always coming to him asking questions like, who are you? By whose authority do you say these things? Why don't you do the things that the other religious leaders do? You know, what's the most important commandment in scripture? Uh, what must I do to have eternal life? All of these questions people brought to Jesus. And he had to answer them. But oftentimes he would take their question and answer with questions, which is always a fun thing. But then you get to the places in scripture where Jesus asked the hard questions. He, where he probed into our life, into our situation and asked questions like, who do you say that I am? Questions like, why are you afraid? when you're in my presence. Questions like, why did you doubt me? And one that, that, that always haunts me, uh, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? See, Jesus was, was filled with these questions that, that at the surface seem innocent, but when we really understand them, are powerful and challenging into our life. And, and oftentimes, those questions actually weren't even stated. 
They were the implication of something that he taught. And that's where we're going to find ourselves today in Luke chapter 6, because Jesus is, is in a section of teaching. As we go through uh, Luke 6, he's in this, this long stretch of teaching where he's actually responding to some questions. He's responding to some questions from the religious leaders on his uh, spiritual habits and practices, and he's responding to their questions. But as he teaches... I think as we listen to uh, what he, he says and the, the, the parables that he tells here today that we're going to look at, I think the implication is we should be asking some questions of ourselves. And, uh, and I think today we're going to see three questions specifically that should examine where we're at with the, the topic of pride. Because he's talking to religious leaders and he's talking to the Pharisees and he's really trying to, to unpack their tendency to be prideful. And, and, and the religious leaders had this incredible tendency to, to live with pride and arrogance. But see, it's not just the Pharisees. We can't just sit here and be like, oh, those Pharisees, they were, they were a piece of work, weren't they? Because we're the religious people. Here we are, uh, you know, in church on a Saturday uh, or a Sunday or, you know, whenever you're watching during the week, we're sitting here in church. We're the ones making religion, making Christianity a priority. We're religious people. And we have a tendency to live with pride. And so we're going to look at a couple of parables that Jesus teaches and say, hey, where are we at with this, this topic of pride? Where are we at? Are we living like those religious Pharisees? Are we living with the humility of Jesus? Uh, and there's three questions that you get to answer, um, and I don't have to tell you if you're prideful or not, so you just get to answer them yourself. So uh, Luke chapter 6, let's take a look. We're going to kind of walk our way through this piece by piece. We're going to start down in verse 39, and it says this. It says, he also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. We're going to pause there and come back to the rest of the passage in a minute. But I think the first question that this encourages us to ask ourselves is, who are you allowing to teach you? Who's, who's teaching you? Who's leading you? Who's influencing your life? Because he... he, he starts with this parable of the blind leading the blind. And we, we all have used this at some point, you know, in some comical situation, usually, oh, that's the blind leading the blind there. And, and we, we look at this, and he's not actually talking about, like, two blind people trying to walk through town, but he's talking about who we're allowing to influence, who's leading us, who's guiding us through this, this journey called life and, and humandom. And, and I think that we've got a couple of risks there in regards to kind of being blind and being led by blind people. And the first is that, that we can allow unfit or unqualified people to speak into our life. And that's kind of the first situation of the blind leading the blind. And it's not in your notes, but you can jot it down there if you want. And, and this might be, you know, a toxic friend or family member, someone who is, whose life is a mess and has no business speaking into your life. But if we're not careful, we can start to follow some of what they say and start to allow them to influence us, usually negatively, and all of a sudden we look and we look more like their life uh, if we're not careful. The second situation that, that is a risk for us in this is that, that we can go look for people that are just going to reinforce our viewpoint. And here's, here's what this looks like on a small scale. You know, I've, I've had moments where I'm really heated about something really, like, worked up, and I just want to go rant to someone. So I'm like, okay, who can I go rant to? And I go pick someone, and I start ranting, thinking they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, what, what were they thinking and all that, and all, only to discover about three-quarters of the way through my rant that they take the other person's side. And I'm like, why did I come to you? Like, I wanted, I wanted you on my side. Like, you were supposed to agree with me and tell me how bad this other person was, but you're doing the opposite. But that's actually incredibly helpful. We need that in our life. We need people being the contrarian and saying, hey, I don't think you thought about this perspective. Hey, I think the other person's right in this disagreement. Hey, I think you have something that you could learn from this. So we, we, we can't just go look for people who always agree with our viewpoint because if, if they're just going along with what we're saying, it's the blind leading the blind. But I think the, the highest risk we have in this is that the only people speaking into our life are ourselves. And we're not letting anyone else speak into our life, and we're just following our own wisdom and guidance. And it's so easy for this to happen because it creeps in from all these messages like, oh, don't let anyone tell you how to live your life. Oh, you know, you just need to follow your gut or you need to follow your heart or, you know, whatever it may be. But 
if we do that, it's literally the blind leading the blind because we need someone speaking into our life. We need someone bringing wisdom and guidance and insight and correction into our life, and Jesus is the one to do that. Jesus is the one who can speak into our life perfectly. He's the one who is not a blind guide. He is the one who can bring wisdom and insight and direction and correction to us. See, that's what he, he's sharing here. He's like, who, who are you following? Who is speaking into your life? Because it should be Jesus. That's why he says here, you know, that, that, that's the whole point. And if we are followers of Christ, we want to be more like Jesus, which is why he said, everyone, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. So is your life today more like Jesus or more like your friends? Is your life today more like Jesus or more like your social feeds? Is, is your life today more like Jesus or just more like you? Because if, if we're followers of Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world, and we believe he died on a cross to pay for our sins and we've made a commitment to follow him, then that commitment includes us living more like Jesus with each day. So how do we do that? First, we need to get to know his teachings. We can't follow someone we don't know. We can't follow instructions we don't understand. So we have to get to know his teachings. How do we do that? With the Bible. You know, the, if, you, if you look objectively at our church, at our services, and what we do here, the Bible really is at the center of everything. You know, we, we uh, include Bible verses sometimes in, in the, the worship songs, in between the lyrics. The lyrics contain references to Scripture. The biggest chunk of our service is teaching and study on Scripture. We want you to know the Bible. And so if, if you are not regularly reading and studying Scripture, let me encourage you to start and if you don't have a Bible, just grab one of those that, out of the chair in front of you, take it with you, and start reading it. And if you don't know where to start, start in the New Testament. That's the, the latter half of the Bible. We'll have a blank page that says New Testament. You just start there. That's the teachings of Jesus followed by the, the, the process of the early church establishing. If you want to be more specific, just start in Luke. That's where we're at. This whole year, our church is studying the book of Luke. So as you read and you have questions, you can go back and watch the sermon or you can just like star it and we'll get there eventually at some point this year and you can, you can have your question answered. But, but study the Bible. But the second thing we need to do is we need to submit to his teaching. See, this is, this is just as important as reading it because we can have all the knowledge. We can read it and absorb all of it up here. But if we're not living it out of our hearts, then it's not doing anything. And so when we read scripture, most of us need to spend more time submitting to it than we do arguing with it or questioning it. And for some of us that have a hard time admitting we're wrong, like this person standing on the stage in front of you right here, sometimes we just need to say, hey, I was wrong with this and I need to follow Jesus' teaching. We need to submit, which is where that haunting question from Jesus comes back in, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So that f the first question from this passage in Luke 6 is, who are you allowing to teach you? We've got another question that, that comes up, and that is, how are you evaluating yourself? He continues, verse 41, he says this. He says, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, hey, brother, let me take out the speck that's in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that's in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out that's in your brother's eye. We love this passage, don't we? We love to use this passage on other people, but not so much on ourselves. how it was really intended and to be used here. See, Jesus points us out this reality that, that we are so in tune with other people's faults and failures and issues, but we so overlook our own. And the point here is that, that, that we need to spend more time looking at our own failures and struggles and sins than we do examining other people's. And, and this is no mystery that, or no secret here. Like, if you're married, you probably can list some of your, your spouse's idiosyncrasies and shortcomings while kind of ignoring your own. If you're driving, you know when all the drivers around you make mistakes, 
but you kind of ignore the fact that for the last three turns, you didn't use your signal either. <laughs> See, if you're at work, you probably know the, 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 the ways that your coworkers are irritating or don't get the job done while kind of wondering why you don't get employee of the month every single month all year long. Like, we are so easily focused on other people's faults. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. First, we are so good at justifying in our head our own actions. We come up with a narrative in our head of why we do certain things and why that's okay. But we also so quickly assign motive to other people's actions. And we have no idea what their motive actually is. And the result of this, as Jesus says, is hypocrisy. He says, you hypocrites. When you point out other people's little flaws while having this, this log sticking out of your face, you're a hypocrite. Which, it's no coincidence, this is the, the number one reason most unchurched people don't want to have anything to do with church. And that's significant because the, your unchurched friend or family member or neighbor or coworker may not be interested in church because of the hypocrisy of Christians. And, and it may be that, that we contribute to that. Every time we criticize other people while not looking at our own life, every time we elevate some sin of the month as more significant than others, every time we act like we're perfect and religious, we may add a stumbling block to someone coming to the good news of Jesus. And that's why at Calvary, I'm so glad that one of our core values is transparent living. Because we believe that God's designed us to be real, open, and honest about who we are and allow other people to do the same. Because as we live with transparency, we get to, to kind of shine a spotlight on the log sticking out of our face and shine a spotlight on Jesus' ability to remove those and to redeem those and to heal those while also kind of quenching our tendency to be religious and perfect acting because we're not perfect. See, I wanna challenge you guys to, to, to really make that transparent living value something that you value in your own life because there's an incredible amount of healing, there's an incredible amount of amazing and good things that can come when we just live transparently with the people around us. But I, I wanna come back to this because I think if we're not careful, we can read this and kind of miss that Jesus is not saying that either the log or the speck should stay there long term. And, and see, we can, we can focus too much on either one, but in this parable, he's actually saying that both need to come out. So he's not saying that we never go and, and, and offer to take the speck out of our brother's eye, you know, theoretically. It's not that that should never happen, but I think that, that it kind of shows us a couple of things that should happen. First, we need to take an us-first approach to critical evaluation. And that sounds weird, because in church, we're never told to put ourselves first. It's always others first, it's our family first, it's our coworkers, it's the community first. But when it comes to criticism, it should be us first. We should be looking at our own life and, and looking at it and evaluating our life and, and, and how are we doing with this before we say anything to anyone else. And that's where scripture comes in. It's us looking and saying, hey God, how am I doing based on your words? And I heard a, a pastor from California say this, and I think it's so helpful that the Bible should be a mirror into our life, not a, a magnifying glass into someone else's life. So anytime we're reading it and we're thinking, oh, so-and-so needs to read this and I'm gonna copy and paste this and send it to them because they need to read this and really be corrected, we've missed the point. And likewise, anytime we're listening to a sermon and like, oh, I need to tag so-and-so in the comments or I need to send them this podcast because they really need to hear this, we may have missed the point. Now, if they're going through a hard time and you think it's gonna be encouraging to them and, and, and bring the hope of God into their life, that's different. But, but we're, we're not to use it as a magnifying glass into other people's lives. So if we, if we wanna see clearly and, and balance this like log and, and spec thing well, it starts with an us first mentality, but then it also needs to include us surrounding ourselves with people who can speak into our life and correct us and inviting them to do that often. Because we might be blind to something, we may not see something in our own life and we might need someone to point out that speck or that log in our own eye. 
We may need someone who can say, hey, I don't know if you've noticed this, but, but you have this tendency, or, or I've noticed that, that you've kind of got this habit that I don't think is good for you. So we need to surround ourselves with those people who are willing to, to correct us and, and challenge us and invite them to do that. And finally, you're like, okay, but we still haven't done anything about the spec. This is all about the log. What about the spec? If you see the spec, help others with love and gentleness. See, it's not that we should never do this, because if we see something in someone else's life and we don't say anything, that's actually unloving. It's like if we were walking out you know, of a restaurant down on, on, on Main Street downtown and we saw someone just walking on their phone, texting, and like walking straight into the street while this car sped down the street, going to hit them, we could be like, those people texting and walking... <laughs> You know, those devices are going to be the end of this society. They're just, and we could sit there and criticize and all that, but us not saying something is the unloving thing to do. The loving thing to do is to get their attention and stop them. And the, the same is true of sin in people's life. Listen to what Galatians 6.1 says. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. See, we, we do this with the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If you're led by the Spirit, if God is leading you to do this, then do it with gentleness as well, it says. See, Jesus shares this parable about seeing clearly. He's got the, the blind leading the blind. He's got the, the speck and the, the log. And he's talking about this. And you're like, okay, where's this going for Jesus? And what he's wanting to do is say, hey, how are you doing at living like me? Are you living... Uh, in submission to my teaching and my leadings? How are you doing with this? And he, he shares one more thing that will give us our final question. We keep reading verse 43. He says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. And the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So our final question tonight is, what fruit is present in your life? And I love that Jesus, you know, talks about a fruit tree because when we think about that in real life, I can stand up here and, and tell you about this fruit tree that's in my backyard and how much time I spend watering it and, and, and pruning it and shaping it and how much fertilizer I put in it and all the nutrients. I can talk about all the process of what I'm doing, but you can come over to my house and look at it and see what kind of tree it actually is. In the same way, our life is, is a visible representation of where we're at spiritually. And, and, and we should have fruit, but there's different kinds of fruit that's in our life. Because we can have bad fruit. We can have a life that's marked with anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and lust and envy and greed. And this is evidence that, that we haven't submit some or all of our life to Jesus. And if that's what our life looks like, then we need to come back to the gospel and come back to submitting our life to the good news of Jesus and, and, and handing things over to him. Or maybe our life has no fruit. Maybe it's not that we have bad things, but there's not really a lot of good things either. Which means maybe we've been doing this Jesus thing for a while and have gotten a little complacent. And maybe our biggest sin is a sin of omission and not doing the things that we know we ought to do. The book of James says if that's the case, then that for us is sin also. But what we all hope for is the, the good fruit that Jesus mentions here. In the book of Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the, the fruit of, of what God wants to do th with the Holy Spirit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These things that, that the Holy Spirit wants to bring about in your life and mine. But notice that it's called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of like religion or the fruit of Christianity or the fruit of wisdom. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, meaning only God can bring these things into our life. 
It's not from us trying harder or, or spending more weekends at church or, or, or reading more. It's us submitting our life to God and letting him lead us. So that question comes back of what fruit is present in our life? And that's the question that I hope sticks with you of, of what, what fruit do you see? Is it the fruit of you or the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Is it the fruit of the, the society around you or is it the fruit of God's indwelling in your life? And if you're not happy with the fruit, maybe tonight's the night where you say, hey, how can I do things differently? See, I was uh, reminded of a quote this week and, and it said, our life is perfectly designed to get the outputs we are currently getting which is a really, really fancy intellectual way of saying if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. Which for us tonight means if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're gonna keep getting the same fruit that you see in your life currently. And so if, if you're not happy, if it's bad fruit, if it's no fruit, if it's not enough good fruit, let me challenge you to ask, hey, where do I need to, to submit to God's teaching in my life? Where do I need to say, okay, God, you, you take over, you lead me here so that I can have your fruit in my life so I can live more like your son, Jesus? Because that's our, our hope and our prayer for you. And I pray that you would, you would follow Jesus' teaching and live with, with his humility and transparency while allowing him to remove those planks from your eye so that you can have his fruit show up in your life. Let's pray as we conclude here. God, we thank you that, that you are patient with us, uh, a people who are, are fickle, a people who are impatient and unkind, a people who are hypocritical and prideful. And God, we really have no reason to be prideful or arrogant about our life or our spirituality or anything, God. And so God, we thank you that you are patient with us as Romans says, even while we were yet sinners, we thank you that you died for us. And God, I just pray that, that you would help us to live more like your son, Jesus. To not live with pride and arrogance, thinking we're better than we're ought, but God, live with humility. Help us to, to live transparently, saying, hey, we've, we've had some planks in our eyes, but it's the grace of God who's helped us through that. And I pray that you would uh, just begin to work in us to bring fruit, to bring about the fruit of the Spirit, to, to, sh to make our life look different. Because as you said in this passage, we want, at the end, our life to look more like the life of our teacher, who is Jesus. So help us in that. And along the way, help us to glorify you and not to take any credit for what you're doing in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.